Come cook with me, my kitchen. Today, we're going to make pollo alla cacciatora, chicken cacciatore. Very easy recipe, packed with great flavor, and easy to make. Pork chop milanese, a wonderful new alternative on how to make the perfect pork chop. And for dessert, macedonia di frutta. It's true, it features fruit, sugar, and something else quite special. And learn how? I don't belong in the woods at all. <laughs> Come for the recipes. Stay for the story. I do have a beard, but it's the closest thing that I have about looking like an outdoorsman. I am the most inept camper, I think, in the history of Italy and United States combined. However, I have a very good friend, my uh, desk partner uh, at the brokerage house where I worked before I became a chef, and he was passionate about camping. At the end of the day, as we compare notes for our trades, profits and losses, we say, no, you really got to come with me. I want to take you. I want to show you what Mother Nature is like. So. After months and months of this campaign, I said, you know what, let's go. I want to see what it's like to sleep under the stars. Pollo alla cacciatore. Now, pollo alla cacciatore usually involves either bacon or pancetta, mushrooms, uh, pearled uh, onions. And I'm asking myself, what does cacciatore mean, by the way? Cacciatore means hunter. So chicken hunter style. I'm thinking, this hunter is going out in the woods <laughs> to actually get something. What's he going to do, come home and eat chicken instead because he was not successful? So how does the name work? I don't care. This is the truth. I don't care. I love this dish. What I love about it is the explosion of flavors that comes by the union of all of these ingredients together. The pancetta, the pearl onions, the red wine sauce, the chicken cooked just perfectly, and just a little touch of rosemary. Let me show you how to make it. You're going to love it. Let's make some chicken cacciatore. The first thing that we want to do is to brown the pancetta. If you don't have pancetta available, you can always use bacon, but I prefer pancetta. Why? Pancetta has the perfect balancing of all of these elements. There's a lot of salt, there is pepper, there is onion, and the aroma is wonderful. Plus, the pancetta has a high content of fat, which is going to melt into the oil. As soon as the pancetta crisps up just a little bit, I will take it out, but I will keep the fat in there. Why? In there, I want to brown the chicken breast. And with the fat that has now leaked out of the pancetta, it will give the chicken breast a unique flavor, something that truly is gonna make it completely different from anything else they had before. At this point, we have the perfect look for the pancetta. What I'm gonna do is to strain it out using a slotted spoon. I'm gonna increase the heat on the oil. The chicken breast, I treat it in a unique fashion. All that I've done with it, I simply dusted it with a little bit of flour, a good amount of salt and pepper. This is very basic. If you wanna take it somewhere else with the flavor, you can add onion powder, garlic powder, paprika does very well. But in this case, I just wanted it to be basic because there are so many other flavors that we will add to the sauce. So here we go. You don't want to cook the chicken all the way through in this process, and this is something that you need to be aware of. What we want to do is we want to sear the chicken by giving it a nice browning on the outside, and that's the reason why I've coated it with flour. There's a reason for every step that we take. We're helping the chicken create this wonderful crust on both sides of it. Then we're gonna let it rest aside, and in the same pan, we'll make the sauce. I'm looking for some significant signs. Allow me to point them to you. Just a little bit of darkening here on the edges gives you the sense that the flour has crusted up nicely. We just want to do it on the other side. And then remember, the chicken is still raw on the inside once we take it out because the braising that will follow into the sauce will complete the flavoring of it. All right, we're there. At this point, I turned off the heat from underneath the chicken and a let it rest and take it out. The oil that is in the pan, we want to get rid of. Whatever is left in there, leave it there because those are the flavors that will actually enrich the dish. At this point, we add a little bit more olive oil. Time has come for us to build 
a layer of flavors. And we start with the mushrooms. I have cremini mushrooms that I'm using, and you can use any mushrooms that you want. But I love the cremini because of the color that they have and the great flavor that they have. Then the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to reinsert the pancetta that we cooked. This one is going to be great for us. It's going to reestablish once again the pork base. Pearl onions that we have peeled and parboiled. And then whole garlic cloves that I cut in half. And the reason why I leave them this big is because this is going to be a long braising sauce. And one of the things that you need to realize is that when you cook things for that long, if they're too thin, they tend to burn. The next thing is a secret, not that many people know about it. Why do I do it? Did I invent it? No, I really didn't. The truth is that both here in my home in California and in my home in Sicily, we always had a lot of uh, rosemary growing around us. So I add the rosemary because I love the flavor of the rosemary, but also because I love the aroma that it does have. There you are. Fresh rosemary, never use dry one. Dry one is, yes, flavorful, but the problem is that it doesn't cook softly into the sauce or the ingredients that you put together and they always stick in your teeth. Now, this will be enough. But being Sicilian, it's important to add a little bit of red pepper flakes, put a little bit of spice. You see that the garlic is starting to brown softly and that is for us the signature for the next ingredient addition. First, I like to always put a little bit of salt to make sure that the mushrooms have some. There it is, mamma mia che bellezza. And now we go with the red wine sauce. This mixture already is full of flavor. The next thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to add the chicken breast. Remember, the chicken breast, we have seared it on both sides, but it's still somewhat raw on the inside. Now, what we want to do is to let it braise right here into the sauce, all right? We're gonna let the chicken simmer in the pan uh, until it's ready. Why don't we move this on the side let me show you how to make the green beans that will make a wonderful accompaniment to this dish. Green beans, fagiolini verdi, like we like to say in Italian. You should know that we have parboiled these uh, green beans. Why? What I want them to do is to get nicely crisped in the cooking process that we're doing right now. In this pot, what we have is some oil. We had a little bit of red pepper flakes. Now, let's get started. This is what I like to do with them. You can see I'm already picking up a little bit of color. At this point, a little bit of chopped garlic to go with it. A little bit of lemon zest, freshly done. And this is the first hint that the beans are getting of the flavor of the lemon. We're gonna give the hint of the lemon in two different ways. This way, just so that some pieces of the lemon zest will actually get stuck on the outside of the bean. So with every bite that you take, you will taste that. The other one instead is going to be done as soon as the beans start to brown up a little bit. So the next thing that I'm going to do is the addition of a little bit of lemon juice, and then a little bit of salt as well. I'm gonna cook this on high heat until the lemon juice completely evaporates and what's left behind is this incredible flavor that the beans have picked up. I don't know why I get so excited about beans. I mean, it's green beans, they're vegetables. The reason why I'm so excited is because once I discovered how to make this technique, I became so incredibly enamored with all the variations of what can be done with this. The green beans are done, our chicken is basically finished, and now we're ready to play. Let me show you how. First thing I wanna do is to add the scalloped potatoes that we cooked earlier. Then we go with the beans, which I like to place in the back of the potatoes, just like this. And whichever way they fall, don't get too, too design driven because nothing is ever gonna look perfect. And then the next thing is the addition of the chicken breast, which now is cooked to perfection right in here. The beauty of it all is coming now. And here are all this beautiful accoutrements, the sauce itself, the red wine sauce. This, to me, is what makes this particular dish so wonderful. 
its sauce, its flavor, and all of these other ingredients that get together and create this dish into something iconic, yet something so simply made. And this is how you make chicken alla cacciatura. The guy was super equipped. Uh, he had a beautiful uh, tent, one for him, one for me. Uh, he had a fireplace. I had never seen so much camping gear in my life. The one thing he did not have was a portable bathroom. I really understood right there and then that that could have been an issue. So the next morning, I said to him, excuse me, where are the bathroom? He looked at me and says, dude, we're in the middle of the forest here. What bathroom? You just go out there in the woods. You hold the tree, you do what you gotta do, then you come back in here and we go jump in the river and that's how we clean ourselves. I said, you know what, if Tarzan can do it, Nick Stellino can do it. I am so excited to share this recipe. It's an unusual way to cook a pork chop. Pork chop Milanese. Very exciting, very simple, full of flavor. Let me show you how to make it. I come armed to do culinary battle. I have with me a mallet. As you can see, this mallet is multi-phase, but we'll use this, the smooth one. What for? We are going to make pork chop alla milanese. Bone-in pork chop alla milanese. But before we can bring it to alla milanese style, we have to pound it. Now, the reason why I love this recipe is because it's an excellent way to cook pork chop completely different and still maintain beautifully moist and give it this milanese finish to it. Let me show you how to do it. What we have in here is a beautiful pork chop. Look how big and fat she is. On top of the pork chop and on the bottom of the pork chop, we're going to put some parchment paper. And then we start pounding on it using the smooth side of our mallet. Now, every time you take a hit, think of this. You want to hit and move away. This way you maintain a directional flow on how far you want to push the pork chop. Now, I'm gonna lift up and look at it. Now, one of the reasons why we use the paper is because, as you can see, the paper is breaking, but the meat is remaining perfectly well. Now, what I noticed is that we could pound it a little bit more here, we could pound it a little bit more here. That's exactly what we're going to do. From time to time, people ask me, why don't I use this? Well, I'm gonna give you an answer. If you hate a pork chop, you pound it with this tenderizer. You pound it with this tenderizer, you will kill the pork chop. Why? It shreds it, it rips it apart. So let's go back to the pounding. Remember this, unless you hate what you're pounding, don't use this. This is more of a meat tenderizer. Now I lift it. Make sure that it's even on both sides. Look what a beautiful, beautiful flow. In here, I still see that it's kind of thick. Why am I paying so much attention? Why am I looking at all? Because I want it for most of the pork chop to have the same thickness. So in here, I'm gonna pound it a little bit more. We have pounded this pork chop to perfection. Now, we have to do the Milanese coating. How do you do that? Let me show you. What we have in here is a mixture of egg and cream. You can also use milk. I like to use cream because it's much richer. Make sure that when you put the pork chop in, you let it so that the cream and the egg mixture cover both sides of it. Now we go straight into the breadcrumbs, and here they are. You lift it. Now, here's a technique that I particularly like. I like to spoon a little bit of the breadcrumbs on top of the pork chop, and then using my fork and holding it really strong, I push it really hard into it. And this does two things. Not only make sure that they adhere to it, because you wanna make sure that you have a nice covering that's even all the way through, but it also creates a nice, interesting pattern for you, as you can see. Does this design matter at all in terms of the flavor? None whatsoever but it's just beautiful to do it. Then you lift it. 
Make sure that you coat the side as much as possible so it has this beautiful uniform look. You go to the other side and you do the same thing. Using the fork, push down and make sure that the breadcrumbs stick perfectly. You notice that I put no salt and no pepper on top of the pork chop before I pound it and before I marinated it. The Italian style breadcrumbs, even the one that you make according to my recipe or the one that you buy at the store, have an enormous amount of salt and pepper and flavor and spices into it. So I do not want to do too much. This is completely coated with the best of all possible flavors. The pork chop is ready. Now I'm gonna put it on the plate and then I'll show you exactly how to fry it attentively. We have the oil in the pan really, really hot. I uh, cooked it on very high heat. Now we are going to add the pork chop. Watch this technique because it's very important. I hold it by the bone. I start from this point and then I go down all the way down to this point. Why do I do it this way? More often than not, when I'm in a rush to cook, if something slips out of your hand and it splashes out, it splashes away from you. Now, once you put this in, reduce it down to medium. I find that whenever I fry something in a pan, whenever I saute or I cook something in the pan, if I keep the oil to a very high heat, it actually burns. And what we want to do, yes, we do want it to brown the uh, pork chop alla milanese for us, but we do not want it to blacken it. So medium, we have a gentle way in which the meat, which we now are pounding to just about a half an inch thick, will cook gently into the oil. The pork chop has cooked perfectly on one side. Now it's time for us to turn it. Watch the technique that I use. I take the bone, move it away. I use the bone as the handle. Now here we go to the other side. And look how pretty she is. Do you remember before when I was breading the pork chop and I was showing you with a fork how to press the breadcrumbs on top of it? One of the biggest mistakes that more often people do is they don't press the crumbs with the eggs too well on the outside. So what happens is that the crust breaks, the oil penetrates and makes it very, very oily. This way it creates like a crust. This crust is full of flavor and that ultimately it will give us the most effective Milanese you have seen. One more bit of information. You will notice that because of the way in which it is, usually the oil doesn't make it all the way up to the bone. So I have a little trick to show you. Watch what I do. Slightly tilt it over. The oil is so hot that on contact, it will seal the bone and everything around it. Oh, she's ready. The pork chop, it's perfectly cooked. I've turned off the heat and now we're ready to plate it. This is the first move in the plating. What I like to do then is to take a wonderful tomato salad and put it on one side, right here. Then on the other side, put a little bit of Maureen's farro. Maureen's will only know what a beautiful picture I'm painting with the recipe. And then just a little bit of arugula salad that I dress with just a little bit of salt, extra virgin olive oil, and lemon juice. What a beautiful combination of great Italian-style salad and a pork chop alla milanese. In this, ladies and gentlemen, this is how you make pork chop alla milanese. So I hugged my favorite tree, and as I did that, all of a sudden I realized, looking up at the top of the hill, that a young bear had taken a liking to me. And I realized that in the midst of the performance of my duties, I should do something to scare the bear because if the bear was to make friends with me and coming toward me, the acceleration of the undertaking of the purpose that I had at hand could have been one of disastrous proportion. It was at the moment that I let go of the tree and I said to the bear, go away, go away. When you hug a tree on a hill slanted downward, you should never let go of the tree. I did. <laughs> Macedonia di frutta. Macedonia di frutta is a marinated fruit salad. But what makes this fruit salad special? Well, it's the liquor you put in it. And of course, a copious amount of sugar. 
When I was a little boy, I remember my mom and dad going to a restaurant, and this was always on the menu of every single restaurant. Lately, however, when I went to visit my parents and over the last five years, I almost seen it completely disappear from Italian restaurant uh, menus. So I want to share with you something that I think is very easy to make. It's an ideal dessert to make for summertime. Of course, it's something that you only want to share with the adults because uh, there is no way of making this marinated fruit salad without the liqueur. But it's one of those things that not only livens up a party, but it has a wonderful flavor. And the wonderful flavor really is brought by the marination. And not only the sugar, but in this case, when it comes to liqueur, you can use grappa or you can use vodka. Even though I grew up with, uh, with grappa, I have to say that for some reason, I like vodka better. Let me share with you how to make Macedonia di Frutta. First thing we do, we start with oranges. We peel these oranges, we cut them in the small pieces. Here we go into the mixing bowl. Next to the oranges, we have in here some uh, red grapes that we cut in half. These are seedless. The reason I prefer them to be seedless is because this way, nothing gets stuck in between the teeth. Then strawberries. Why strawberries? Well, you've seen my show long enough. You know I have a love affair with strawberries. So here we go. Strawberries as well. Then another great addition is the addition of banana. Banana does a wonderful job. And the problem that usually banana causes that darkens up, in this case, it will not happen because what will happen with the uh, vodka, in this case, is they will completely coat the outside of it and the fruit will remain wonderful, brilliant, at the same time, soft, tender, and full of flavor. And then we go with another addition. What we have in here is apples. Choose whatever apples you like, whatever color. As long as you cut them in small dice, we are fine. And then peaches, summer peaches especially. Now, no matter when you do this, if it's spring, if it's summer, if it's winter, especially if it's winter, you are going to be challenged somewhat. How do you solve that challenge? Well, the easier part is to add lemon. Lemon does uh, maintain all the fruit brilliant and colored and gorgeous to look at. But uh, this is not the way to fix it. Now, for this salad to really work, you need to add a little pinch of sugar. This is what you do if you really don't care about what you eat. But if you care about what you eat, the sugar's got to go. It has to be like, how could I say, snow on the mountains in wintertime. It's got to go all over there. The sugar is extremely important. It will marinate into the salad. It will add sweetness to those fruits that might be maybe too early in the season that they are not yet strong enough to have a sweetness of their own, they have not aged properly, maybe they've been picked from the tree earlier on, and this is something that you do to make sure that they return to the proper sweetness. But in order to make sure that this salad really does well, there it is. In this case, I'm using vodka. Grappa is the other great liqueur that you can use. Anything that's clear in color is the best way to go. In the old days, I remember the restaurants in Italy, they would have big bats full with the fruit and the juice on the inside, and they were known for the different fruits that they would mix. All of them put all sorts of little spices. What you can do at this point, if you want to, you can add some chopped mint, you can add some chopped parsley, some chopped basil, but this, this is exactly the way in which I like it. Now, this salad cannot be eaten now. For this salad to work, you have to place this in the refrigerator. And if I was you, I will let it rest overnight. Why? What happens? Overnight, the vodka mixed together with the sugar, mixed together with the lemon, penetrates the fruit. The fruit releases its own juices into the uh, fruit salad itself, making this Macedonia truly unique. And when you finally bite into it, what you realize is that it's almost having a series of tastes of a tendency of a texture that's like ice cream. How can I say ice cream and fruit in the same word? Well, I think that it does taste like ice cream. Maybe it's the copious amount of vodka that makes me talk that way. But as far as I'm concerned, this is wonderful. Now, I have some that I made last night. It's in the refrigerator. Let me go get it. And when I come back, I'm going to show you how to plate it. I always like to present this in a martini glass, and there are reasons for it. The martini glass holds it all in. Look how the color has some swat subdued and how they're falling into each other. Look how tender they are. This marination has done a wonderful job by us. 
Now, not only you want to put the fruit in there, which is the most important element in this, but the fruit juices, the most wonderful juice that is accumulated at the bottom. There is the vodka, there is the lemon juice, and there is the juice released by each of the pieces of fruit. It's, well, as you can imagine, even this much sexier. This is almost perfect. One last touch, and there is the addition on top of a little bit of mint. Here I'm getting a little bit too artsy, but this is exactly how you make Macedonia di frutta, Italian style marinated fruit salad. The bear got scared and ran the other way. I tumbled all the way down to the river. It was a good thing. I made friends with a lot of things on the way down I shouldn't have. And that, that was the last time I went camping. Nick Stellino, outdoorsman. Never gonna happen. No, no. Now we add a little parsley. And now we add a little parsley. A little parsley on top. There goes the parsley. Parsimiliano. Nosotros parlamos el parsley de ola.